Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome back to Talking With Talent. I hope you all had a lovely break and the festive period. However you spent it, have you managed to spend it, I hope it was pleasant. Um, but welcome to 2021. Uh, we've got a lot lined up for you, but today we have my wonderful sister-in-law, Ashlyn Diaz. Hi! <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me today. So we'll be chatting a lot about, well, your career so far and your views on the industry and... Well, we'll just see where it goes, really. Um, but as I ask everybody when we first start is for you, um, how did the passion begin? Like, where was the initial spark? Well, I think like most people, I mean, it sounds so wanky, doesn't it? Am I allowed to swear on this, by the way? Yeah, just it's thought... fine. <laughs> Good. You have done now. <laughs> well, I've started well, <laughs> so uh, might as well carry on that way. So, yeah, I think it does sound really wanky to kind of say I've just always wanted to be an actor or like since I was a child. But it's it's kind of true in my case. I my aunt when I was really young was an actor. And um, I mean, I was tiny when she was an actor. I barely remember it. But seeing her up on stage is some of my really formative memories. And I, I think part of it comes from being a kid that loved reading and loved stories and creating. And I think there's just kind of no truer form of storytelling than acting. It's such a, a wonderful privilege to have to be able to create in this way. Um, and it's something that I found joy in from a tiny age. I think I was like maybe five, four or five when I did my first little bit of acting just at right. school and got bit by it. And yeah. it's never quite let go. <laughs> Decade or so, you then went to study and you studied in London, is that right? You went Initially, to two places first. Yes, so I, I, I struck a deal with my parents because <laughs> um, poor things, they'd grown up, worked really, really hard to get to where they were and, and you know, get to a, a place where they could send their kids to nice schools and and you know, so that we had a bit of a chance to academia. And then they came out with a daughter who wanted to be an actor. So I struck up a deal with them that uh, if I went and did an academic degree first, that they would help me go to drama school afterwards. Um, and at the time, I thought it was awful. And I thought this is just the worst thing ever that I can't just go and do what I want to do. But actually in hindsight, doing an English uh, BA first really helped me understand the background of a lot of the texts that I was doing. Um, I ended up doing a lot of theatre. I went to the University of Kent um, in Canterbury who have an amazing uh, theatre society and, and drama society. And so I was really lucky that I got to work on some amazing shows. Um, and then from there, I went to Drama Centre, which actually no longer exists. Um, no. no. So Drama Centre, back when I uh, was studying there, was at Central St. Martins in Farringdon um, in Backhill. And back then they used to offer a two year film acting degree as right. a master's um but we had the same number of hours as the ba course just squished into two years so we just got no no time off whatsoever yeah. um but unfortunately it closed down i think it was last year or the year before last um okay. which i think is a real loss to the acting world they moved to king's cross it i think the central st martins in general was just leaning towards more um arts based right. degrees anyway mm -hmm. um but I think it's a shame because I, although it, it pushed me to whole new levels, which is probably why it was nicknamed Trauma Centre instead of Drama Centre. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> it, but it's what I needed. It's what I wanted was yeah, to yeah. to feel like I was being pushed every single day. And mm. I, I can really say that for me, at least, it mm. it makes up a lot of who I am now and, and the practices that I use. Striking the deal with the parents is actually quite a common thing as I've, I, I know many people personally who have been to the same sort of thing where they've had to go and do a mathematics degree or any degree before they can go on and um, I guess chase the chase the acting dream. You don't have the two sides of the coin. You've only got your your experiences. But would you recommend that to other people? It's hard to say. I, I will never say that I think that everyone needs to go to drama school. I've worked with incredible actors that I think are fabulous and they've never been into formal training. Um, 
I, I, it's really hard to say. I think I missed out. I probably missed out on a lot of roles not going to drama school straight away because obviously I was that bit older when I came into professional acting. Mm-hmm. Um, saying that, I am not 100% convinced had I gone into drama school at 18 years old, I would still be an actor. Um, right. Because when I went to Kent, I was 18 years old. I had gone to all girls schools. Um, I was so innocent. I, I mean, I was just the biggest naive that you've ever met. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I was, you know that joke? Um, oh, have you heard they've taken gullible out of the dictionary? No, right. it three times. Oh yeah. God, okay. It was bad. Um, but I, for me, I really needed that experience of like living and, mm-hmm. and falling in love and being heartbroken and going to a place and living alone and having friendships and, and meeting toxic people and meeting great people and people from entirely different backgrounds. Because mm-hmm. now as an actor, I, I rely on that. And I rely on my, my world experiences and my life experiences to shape the characters that I play. Yeah. I think if I'd gone to drama school straight away, it, it's not the same as a university drama school you live and breathe acting which is amazing mm-hmm. but at 18 I think that can be dangerous um, yeah. yeah yeah what was your first professional job I, it's probably the best way of putting that I think well, my first professional job was actually when I was 14 ah. um I back when I looked like Harry Potter I had <laughs> a, uh, I had a modeling a theatrical mod- modeling job they called it um which was I played a character called Spike in a language education series called Snapshot. <laughs> of course you and did, sure. I mean, it was intense. Like Spike was a tomboy who loved reggae, which is just not who yeah. I am as a person, but it's great <laughs> fun. And for a 14, 15 year old, I did two of the books and they were kind of like comic strips. Do you remember those like old problem agony aunt pages where it was like photographs of, of actors in the scenes that they were describing? Really? That might have been a bit before your time, but yeah. It was um it was set out a bit like a comic book but with photographs. Okay. Basically. Sure. And um and it was all like it was it was great. You know, I spent weeks uh traveling around with this group of other teenagers taking photos in YMCA's in Liverpool and like staying in crazy hotels good. and bright oh, it was amazing. Um, yeah. and it you know, I I'm really glad I did it because it got me so used to working with the camera. Um Although it did set a terrible precedent, which is that I was called a model on a lot of uh, like child uh, employment forms and stuff. And when you look at the pictures, I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And then you look at the pictures, I'm like wearing Mario style overalls and I've got this terrible bowl haircut and oh, it's just, well, just awful. Everyone's got to start somewhere. So. <laughs> yeah. And as Harry Potter's double, um, you know, that's, that's one place to start. Then after your training, so in your sort of adult life, what was your first professional gig? Uh, I had, it's so difficult because the word professional, I think, has so many difficult connotations because, I, I mean, working as we do in this kind of flux where, where payment is really changeable and, you yeah. know, conditions are really changeable. I mean, my first unpaid job out of drama school was doing a uh, music video for a band called Apollo 440 called A Deeper Dub which was directed uh, by an old classmate of mine Sasha who's now doing amazing work out in Russia but the first job that I kind of consider as my big professional job uh, was I got the part in a really unlikely way I applied myself through Spotlight which other actors watching this will know you just never get seen for this stuff um for a national tour of great expectations and it was the year of i think dickens had been dead 100 years or something um and i got cast as a stellar adam morley who's a fantastic theater director i was directing and i spent four months traveling around the uk uh performing and it was amazing you know i I made friends for life doing the (laughs) the job i learned so much about myself and Mm. about the industry as well and I got to perform in these incredible venues like we would be performing in a a, a 20 seater theatre in Wells next to the sea one day and then the next day we'd be performing in like uh in Manchester in a theatre that I think seated about a thousand people right. um yeah. and it was just it was astonishing I mm. mean it, what a wonderful thing for someone to do who's just starting out it's great yeah this is actually probably a good moment to if anyone out there has not seen it yet uh, on Disney Plus, Disney have just released the film Soul, 
And I feel this is a really important film for us to talk about, actually, because admittedly, I watched it not knowing what it was about. And then about three quarters of the way through the film, I thought it was about if you didn't succeed, you should kill yourself. And I was like, <laughs> Disney, that's not a good message. Um, and then literally, as I thought that, something else happened. I went, ah, there it is. Yeah, I, I was definitely wrong. Um, it, I, I won't ruin the film for anyone, but in a nutshell, it's about the fact of that we, we spend so long trying to get to this destination, we forget to enjoy the little moments in the middle, um, which kind of leads me on to talking about, so yeah, go and see that, go and watch that. It's, it's, it's worth a watch. We work in such a, a difficult profession. It's not for everyone. And it's quite good to, to sit down occasionally and to kind of go, am I doing this because I love it mm -hmm. and I really want to do it? Or am I doing this because I feel like I can't quit? And yeah. that's 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 really important for me because I know so many people that got themselves into terrible mental health struggles and, you know, were really killing themselves at this career that wasn't giving them anything back for such a long time. And it wasn't until they actually stopped doing it that they kind of found their inner joy. Yeah. Um, but for me, the, the one that we were talking about the other day was... Uh, now I'm going to get this completely wrong. <laughs> but this was, um, I do a bit of coaching as one of my day jobs. And this was something a client had said to me, which was, um, you've got to keep your axe sharp. Now, yeah. when I initially heard that, I thought she meant, you've got to keep training, you've got to keep hustling, blah, blah, blah. And then they explained it to me. And actually what she meant was, if you're chopping down a tree with an axe, eventually that tree, that axe is going to get blunt. So every now and again, you have to stop, you have to rest your arms and you have to sharpen your ax. So it's really, really important. And it, it really stayed with me that phrase because I, when I first started in the industry, I made myself sick with trying to do everything, with trying to go to every workshop, with trying to look completely right, having new headshots every single year, with doing every unpaid job, because I just thought it was really important to have a really full CV. Mm. And I think it's it's genuinely taken me, it took me till my late 20s, actually, and it's really hit home now, I'm in my 30s. Mm. But you can't do anything, like nothing, you can't do anything with 100%. If you do anything with 100%, then you've got no percents left for absolutely anything left, whether that's your health, your relationship, your family, your other interests. Mm. And I think having a full life is what makes you a good actor. Um, it's yeah. a really toxic sort of perspective when I see people online, they're like, you have to give everything. You've got to, you know, you've got to live and breathe it. Like, oh, God, no, that would be awful. You've also, got to... those people become really boring. And like, if I was in a, in, if it, for instance, if I was a casting director and someone came in and they were like, oh, I've just read about this, this book. I'd be like, that's great. What did you do last weekend? Oh, I read the book. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, it's, I, you know. I think it's it's also about, I mean, I when people read a lot about acting mm. and they go to all the classes and they go to all the workshops, but they don't actually allow themselves to have a life. When they actually play characters, I think sometimes there's a little bit of an inability to emotionally connect with that character mm. because they're not allowing themselves to feel real emotions. It's constantly yeah. artificial. And that's that's a little... I think after a while it makes you staid and and a little um a little beige. Yeah, and and thank you for bringing the hundred percent one in. That's actually that's actually the one I was thinking about. And I forgot <laughs> about the axe sharpening one. You've done some wonderful projects since um, from passion projects where I say that like for instance poison ivy. A lot there must be a lot of uh, anxiety about bringing a character that is so beloved, so known. Um, and also with a, an audience that can be quite brutal with um, your nerds and geeks. Uh, they, they, they can have quite a strong opinion, certainly with superhero films and sci-fi films and the Star Wars films that you've got behind you, they can often have quite a volatile opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, how was stepping into the shoes of Ivy and um, creating this character, which was so beautifully done? Um, but how was that sort of, I guess, uh, journey? Well, we were really lucky. Um, I think partially because it's a character that's been done quite badly before. Um, a part of my experience kind of writing the film and, and researching Ivy as a character was going back and looking at 
fan films that have been made in the past and and you know looking back at past iterations of Mm -hmm. Ivy and as far as I could tell the only really great iterations of Ivy were done in a couple of the video games and a lot of the animations were fantastic Mm -hmm. um she's often the thing that always baffled me about interpretations of Ivy was that she's always kind of shown apart from in some of the comics and video games and animations as a entirely villainous character that is Mm. only led by her sexuality and that's something that I really disagree with I think the fascinating thing about Ivy is that I think that she matches Bruce in a lot of ways um she is kind of morally ambiguous if anything Mm. she can be seen as an anti-hero rather than a villain or if you're gonna call her a villain then a villain who does it for pretty good reasons most of the time um I think I love that she is she's not just about sexuality she's also about motherhood about nature about womanhood um and she's just fascinating so when we were creating the story and you know workshopping and rehearsing and building up ideas for the film what was really nice was that it felt like a very cohesive project to be working on um we'd done a lot of background research we'd worked out what because there are so many different strands of of who ivy is and who Mm -hmm. obviously comic books have like a million different parallel universes and different trains of thought about where they started and how they became who they are and everything so we created like a a background list of who we felt ivy was and how we felt she came into um, she stopped being Pamela and started being Ivy. Um, what we thought her relationship was with Bruce was like went before she went into the asylum and what she uh, was like while she was in there. Mm. Um, and the fans, we've had such great experiences with the fans. They've yeah. been so supportive. And, you know, I, I actually think Rob, my husband, your brother, um, <laughs> you might have met. Yeah. Uh, he, I think actually he had a much harder job because I think, Batman has been done so well in the past Mm. that you know and people have very set expectations of who Batman is so the fact that he was coming on as Bruce rather than Batman the fact that he was playing it in a way that was very um detective comics rather than the a lot of the kind of filmic perspectives of Batman um was a really big challenge and I think he did really beautifully um I, I feel enormously lucky that we've had so much acceptance from the comic community and the the DC community um and I I very rarely heard any negative feedback to be honest which feels like an absolute miracle (laughs) we made it on next to nothing um we but to be fair we had an amazing crew like Mm. we Charlotte Ball who designed our set is nothing short of a genius um our DOP was incredible we had amazing sound guys our post work was just astonishing Sophie Black our director who also helped exec produce it and literally made the costume was sensational I there's not one person on our crew who I wouldn't snap up to work with again they're just such wonderful people yeah I think actually if I remember correctly I had Four, four random people. It's going to come out wrong, but bear with me. Four random people in my bedroom um, during the Poison <laughs> Ivy for shooting to use my recording equipment. So we recorded the inmates, and we had yes, because um, I I did Scarecrow, I think it was yes, um, that was fantastic. I can't remember, actually, crane, uh, and there was very strange noises coming from my room that day. Um, I'm sure my neighbours were quite concerned, um, but that was good fun. <laughs> Um, no, I loved, that. I loved that. I what was really nice is we had uh, yeah, as you say, about four different actors doing yeah. a variety of different voices and, and it it created such a beautiful, creepy background setting yeah. to Arkham. It was yeah. amazing. Uh Lair, which is still currently in it's not in production, but it's in post-production now. Um, and hopefully we'll see that on the screens in the next year or so. We were astonishingly lucky. We It actually was kind of linked to Poison Ivy, Lair. Ah, um, right. So when we were designing um, what we wanted the look of the film to be like, Rob had seen this film called um, The Conversation, mm-hmm. directed and written by Adam Ethan Crow and starring uh, a friend of Rob's, Julian. Yes, and there was yeah. this one specific shot in there that was 
so beautiful um, and the lighting was so perfect that we actually put it on our Pinterest board for Poison Ivy right. and Rob got in touch with the director and said look I just wanted to say you know if you ever I'd like to take you out for a coffee and have a chat and um, talk about kind of the look of the film and talk about um, what your DOP did and what we're doing and you know just catch up yeah and they got on like an absolute house on fire and through that I then met Adam and his mm -hmm. Mrs Shelley who's uh incredible who right. used to kick butt at Fox and is now a, a freelancer and, and making films under the title of Ditto Films mm -hmm. um and so we got on really well with them just as as people really and they were talking about this film that they were doing like they just announced it at Cannes and mm -hmm. Uh, it had appeared in Variety and it was all very exciting, a lot of buzz around it. And we were kind of going, oh, it'd be really cool if like we could have these little one line parts in it, just appear in it, you know, just to just to be in it would be amazing. <laughs> um, and then when the we did a table read, we helped out, read for characters that we would never in a million years have been cast as. Like, I think I was a middle aged judge in like deep South America at one point. Good um yeah it was fun yeah. um but kind of off the back of helping out with the read through the table yeah. read um adam and shelly asked us to audition and they asked rob to audition for detective adkin and they asked me to read for one of the lead characters um which was so unexpected i i mean i was thrilled but yeah. i had no idea that that had been coming because the two leads were initially written as a lot older than me um and then yeah I got got not the part that I'd gone up for but the other female lead character in it and it was just the most incredible experience like it's any actor's dream to be able to get paid for doing what they love the best and yeah. I was working with this amazing group of people incredibly talented people on this awesome script um, I got to work opposite Corey Johnson, whose films I've <laughs> been watching since I was a kid, and he's that's the Mummy, the uh, actor from the Mummy, is that? Oh yeah, so he yeah. was in the Mummy. He's been in Captain Phillips. He's been in yeah. Born. He's been in like every major film that you can think of, and he's <laughs> such an incredible actor and just mm. a really nice bloke as well. Um, and we had this insane cast and crew. Uh, Stuart White was our DOP, and he's incredibly talented as well um and we've just become really firm friends with all of these people so mm. they've now become such an intrinsic part of our lives um that i i will constantly be grateful to lair mm. because not only was it a wonderful film to work on i can't wait for everyone to see it because it's great and it's so <laughs> um but it, it's also given me just the most wonderful film family so yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. And um, briefly for, without any spoilers, um, what is Lair about? So Lair is about your inner demons as much as uh, the paranormal demons. So essentially um, it's about this couple who haven't been together for very long and my character Maria has just come out of a relationship and she started going out with a woman for the first time in her life um, she's got a teenage daughter she's got a, a I think six-year-old daughter as well and yeah. it's such a complicated time trying to bring them together and, and trying to work out who she is as a person yeah. um, and who she is in this new re relationship dynamic as well um, so to kind of bond the family, they decide to go on a break to uh, London. And right. of course, being a horror, things start going terribly wrong. Um, masterminded by the fantastic Corey Johnson, who um, has his own story. And I don't want to ruin that at all. So okay. you'll have to watch to find out. <laughs> fantastic. Um, and actually, uh, backtracking quite considerably to about halfway through our chat. Um, you were talking about headshots and your, I guess, presence within the, within the industry. Um, how important is it, do you feel, to have, I guess, good headshots is basically, I guess, my, my, my point in, in the sense of, um, and I'm using good as a huge umbrella here and 
what I mean by this is perhaps, do, do you think it's good to have a plethora of different headshots from different people? Do you think it's good to have a load of headshots from one specific time to reuse headshots? Like what is your view? And because you, you've, you've used a lot of um, different photographers over the, over, well, over the time I've known you, you've had a fair few done. Um, and yeah, what is your sort of take on, I guess, changing and just, just the entire use of headshots? I, I think it's difficult because, and I do think it's kind of difficult for everyone. Um, mm. For me personally, it's really important to have uh, headshots that at the very least look like you. Um, I find that really difficult because I've got a really expressive face and I find quite often headshots don't quite capture that element of me. Um, so I'm very reliant on my showreel. Um, sure. But I, I think it's, it's important to have headshots that kind of show off different characters mm. so I will always go into a headshot shoot with a variety of different outfits that I will be attempting to kind of link to different roles that I'd like to play of course, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. my last headshot shoot was with Jenny Scott um, mm. who's brilliant and her work is absolutely gorgeous and I wanted to get a mix in that of kind of a period look I wanted a, a couple that made me look a little bit older because I can look very young but I can also look a lot older and playing in there I'm playing a mother of a teenager so well, yeah, I kind yeah, of yeah. yeah and I look older in there as well like I'm, I'm right. sort of less glam I mm -hmm. let my roots grow I had my hair very straight they kind of did a little bit of bagging under my eyes and stuff um so I wanted to kind of get a little bit of that across mm. um I I'm very fortunate that I live with a talented photographer, Jose Palmer, who you, of course, have already had on yeah. here. Um, and he will occasionally do a shot for me if part of my look changes. Um, right. So he did a, a lockdown shoot a while ago when my hair length had dramatically changed. Mm. Um, but I think you've also got to live within your means. And I think I, yeah. we get pressured so much to spend, spend, spend as actors, like, oh, you've got to invest in your craft, blah, blah, blah. But actually, you don't need new headshots every six months. If you look the same as you did a year and a half ago, then right. great. Use those yeah. photos. Like, all they want to know is what you look like. Um, yeah. If your photos are badly done, like, make sure that you get people to look at them. Make sure that when you're choosing your photos, you're not just choosing from a place of vanity, because which is so hard. Um, course, yeah. You know, um, I think ask a group of people between those that don't know you very well and have only mm -hmm. met you maybe once or twice casting directors and people that do know you very well and know what mm -hmm. your face looks like day to day get their opinions um but also know that you know if you don't have the money getting constant new headshots is not a necessity mm. don't feel pressured into going into your overdraft well yeah yeah uh, th th thank you because the reason i actually brought that up is be it's because you've had I think for, and I'm using myself here, um, but also others have had headshots where they can come up looking the same as the ones you had previously. Um, yeah. But your headshots, and whether it's because you've gone to different people each time, but there's always something uh, uh, something completely different from your last ones, um, which I think is, uh, well, interesting. And also that's why I wanted to ask really about your opinion on on, the importance of it yeah well thank you so much for joining me today and um i hope you haven't gone too much past time um but yes thank you so much it's been so insightful talking to you and you've always got such wisdom to share um, oh, you can find you. everyone so everyone check out ash's work on or ashton's work on um <laughs> on instagram and youtube you'll find it everywhere sorry force of habit there <laughs> um, but no thank you so much it's been lovely talking to you and oh, thanks um, for having me everyone out there stay safe and stay creative uh, there is Light at the end of the tunnel. We will get there soon. Um, there is hope on the horizon, I'm sure. Uh, but yes, thank you. And we will see you next time.